me in here. <laughs> All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the February Rock Game Dev Workshop. For, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam. I am the workshop coordinator and today helping Noah run the stream. Uh, and if you are new to Rock Game Dev, uh, we host workshops on the last Wednesday of every month intended to cater to everyone in the Rochester games community, whether you're a hobbyist, whether you're a student, whether you're a professional uh, or other. Uh, this should be updated. Workshops are now hosted here at Sibley, but we also host some events at RIT and around the city when we do socials. Uh, the next event, if you're curious, will be the RIT meetup. So that will be not here. That will be at RIT's Magic Spell Studios down in Henrietta, about 20 minutes away. Uh, you can come show off your projects, you can get feedback, you can network with the rest of the community. We typically have a very large turnout at those events. Uh, as today, we'll show you, um, typically we will have pizza and drinks provided, and that is also true for next week's event. Uh, full list of events and other Rocking Dev info can be found at our website and our Facebook page, as well as on Twitter and Discord. So just a quick announcement. Um, next week or next month's workshop will be hosted um, by Mark, um, not that Mark, different Mark, um, and will be about sound design. So details on that will probably be posted within the next week or so. Keep your eyes peeled. This was from last month, but yes, quick relocation announcement. In case you didn't get the memo, especially for our friends on Twitch. Uh, Starting this month in January, we are moving all of our Rock Game Dev workshops to the Sibley co-working space, uh, which is open to the public. So you do not have to be a paying Rock Game Dev Patreon member in order to come to these public events like the workshop. If you want to host a workshop, I really encourage you to, or if you just have an idea for a workshop that you'd really like to see, even if you don't necessarily know who's going to host it, please chat with me uh, either today in person or DM me on Discord or on Twitter. Uh, I would love to hear what you have to say. And this is my first time announcing that we are actively pursuing uh, people to give lightning talks. May is going to be another round of our spring lightning talks. Uh, so this is a shorter form workshop format. So everyone gets five to 10 minutes to give a, a workshop rather than a full 40 to 60 plus minute workshop like our typical format. Uh, which means that you can give smaller scoped ideas. You can just kind of test the waters on an idea. Uh, you can go completely off the walls, go bonkers. Um, again, chat with me via Discord, Twitter, or in person uh, if you want to just chat about that. With all of that, I'm going to hand it over to Noah Ratcliffe, who's going to be talking tonight about source control for Git with all levels. So grab some pizza if you're here in person. Otherwise, friends on Twitch, I will be monitoring the chat in just a moment, so feel free to ask any questions, either by raising your hand or by popping them in chat, and I will ask your questions for you. Take it away, Noah. All right, so just some quick setup. Give me just a second, please bear with me. Great, yeah, so this is uh, source control and Git for all levels. Hi everyone, I'm Noah. Uh, I'm the lead developer and co-founder at Aesthetician Labs. I've also worked at Working Man here in Rochester in Magic Spell Studios. I'm a real local games boy. Um, I'm also a, a board member for Rock Game Dev and uh, the stream coordinator, so bear with me as I kind of uh, inhabit two roles tonight. Um, yeah, I've spent about seven, over seven years making games. I've been doing it since I was in high school or a little bit before. Um, and some, some people uh, might know me for drinking water. It's an identity that I'm still working to shake at this point. 
Um, it is important, however, it is also not, you should not build your soul identity around it. All right. So my goal for this workshop is if you've never heard of or used Git before, um, it'll provide a broad overview of what it is, what it's used for, how it works, uh, how to use it, uh, so just very basics. Uh, and then that'll hopefully provide an introduction for those of us who have worked with Git before or maybe using it in some capacity with Teams or have used it before um, for the workflows and neat trick stuff, which is basically uh, talking about Git clients, Git GUI clients, uh, how to configure Git, uh, some advanced aliases that you can use and that I use, uh, as well as we're going to touch on submodules, um, talk about branching models and the Aesthetician Labs branching model uh, that we use. And then we'll touch a little bit on automation and uh, like constant integration stuff. So part one, basic overview of Git. So Git, according to their documentation, is a free and open source distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. Um, Git is software that works on nearly every OS. There's a build of it for just about anything. Um, it's a command line interface tool, uh, so you usually use it from the command line. Uh, there are a number of great graphical user interface clients, though, so uh, many people are familiar with maybe like uh, GitHub for desktop or source tree. Um, and just as a point of clarification, Git is not GitHub or source tree. A lot of people will use those terms interchangeably. Um, GitHub is the most popular Git repository host, and SourceTree is a very popular Git GUI client. Um, but there's no need to be a jerk about this. We're all talking about the same thing when somebody says GitHub or somebody says, oh, it was on SourceTree or so on and so forth. Um, or we use SourceTree in our team. We all know what it means. There's no need to be a jerk. Um, but it is important to be clear where you can. So uh, if you're wondering, you know, what is source and version control? A version control system tracks the history of changes as people and teams collaborate on projects together. As the project evolves, teams can run tests, fix bugs, and contribute new code with the confidence that any version can be recovered at any time. So version control is a tool that uh, keeps track of changes in a code base for a project over time and basically records a timeline of changes. So why use Git as your version control system? Uh, well, number one, it's great for collaboration. It's a distributed version control system. Um, it's also the most widely used by a very large margin, um, which isn't always the best reason for things. But uh, in this case, according to st uh, the Stack Overflow 2018 developer survey, uh, nearly 90% of all developers uh, surveyed, this was uh, 75,000 responses, or about 75,000 responses, um, nearly 90% use Git. Uh, it keeps track of old changes, so there's the possibility if you screw something up in your game and you're like, oh, it's not working anymore, I just want to go back to when it worked, you can just go back um, and then, you know, it's no problem. It also has a lot of uh, really neat tricks that we're going to explore as we go forward. So uh, this is an XKCD comic. Um, it's often kind of... Uh, a trope that Git is something that's overly complicated or scary um, or uh, so on and so forth. Controversial opinion, Git doesn't have to be scary. I think there's a lot of people who perpetuate this idea that it is scary and so it is viewed as such. So it kind of is a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Um, I think by understanding how Git works, you can have a better understanding of um, how things can go wrong and what it means when things go wrong with Git. So Git basically stores, um, looks at what it calls the working directory, which is the real state of files on your computer. So when you have um, a Git repository on your computer and you have, uh, say, some source code in there, and whatever your computer shows, like in Windows, when you're in the Explorer, for example, the file Explorer, what you see there is the working directory. Um, Files are checked out from the repository. Uh, so the repository stores all the files, and you can check them out with Git into the working directory. Uh, file changes, or diffs, 
are stored in the staging area. So when a file is changed, Git says, hey, uh, I have a different version of this file. I think that this file has changed or has been removed or so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, you can tell Git, OK, I have changed this file. Please stage this for the next commit. And then diffs in, the sta in staging can be committed to the repository. And the repository, in effect, stores a timeline of snapshots of your working directory in the form of commits over time. So when a file changes, you say, OK, Git, I've changed this file. And then, uh, or you say, I've changed these three files. And then you say, OK, I'm going to make a commit. And a commit is basically a picture of your working directory at that time um, with the changes that you stage in staging. So here's kind of an example from the GitHub or the Git website. Um, so you say you have version one, you have three files, file A, B, and C. Um, in version two, you have changed file A, and you have changed file C. Uh, so you have version A1 and C1, but B remains the same. Uh, in version three, there's a snapshot where A1 has remained, or A has remained the same, so you keep A1. B has remained the same, so you keep B. But maybe you changed something in C, so now you have version two of C, and so forth. Um, so every time you commit to the repository, you're committing a snapshot of the working directory and whatever current version of the file where it's at. Um, this is a little bit confusing to look at at first glance, but basically, um, files, and I'm gonna, I'm actually, I'm sorry for the stream, but I'm gonna get up and point out, point out the projector. I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, thanks, Toggle. So, files start in the untracked uh, state. So, if you create a file in your working directory and Git didn't know about it before, it's gonna say, hey, there's a file here, I'm not sure, like, you want me to do something with this? Um, so that's untracked. So then, the first thing you do when you create a new file is you add it to Git. And so that goes all the way to staging. And so now you can maybe um, tell Git, OK, I've, I've created this file. You make a commit. And then later, you make a change to the file. So, or rather, you make a commit, and it goes to the unmodified, or unmodified state. And then you make a change to the file, so it goes to the modified state. And now Git says, hey, I, I have this file here. And before, it, it was like this, but now it's like this. Uh, what do you want me to do with this? And so you can stage it again, you can commit it, and so there's a cycle that you can get in here where files go through editing, being modified, being staged, committed back to the repository, and now the repository treats them as unmodified. If you remove it, it goes back to untrack. So this is removed in the sense that you tell Git to stop looking at it. So you can explicitly remove things from Git without removing them from the file system. Uh, but also if you delete the file, it's the same thing. The fact that the file is no longer there is um, untracked. The change on the file system is, is untracked. Uh, so then you can add the removal of the file to staging, commit it, and now the state of the working directory is uh, unmodified. So as a quick review, the working directory is the files on your hard drive that are tracked by Git. Diffs are changes to files that are stored in commits. Um, a commit is a snapshot of the working director directory identified by a SHA-1 checksum. And the checksum is relatively unimportant unless you're doing really advanced stuff with Git. There's not really a good reason to understand the mechanics behind that. But it is, uh, the, the biggest effect of it is it's why commits are named things like ADB, 40D, or whatever. And if you've never used Git before, you'll see, you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, a repository is a timeline of commits. And um, this is a new, this is a new uh, thing that we haven't talked about. But head is basically the current commit checked out in the working directory. And you'll see that come up later. Uh, basically, the Git keeps a pointer that looks at, OK, this is the commit that we currently have in the working directory. Um, and that's what head is. So if, um, for example, you go back in the timeline, you say, I want to go back to a commit from three commits before, head will move back there. And a tag is a named pointer to a specific commit. It's kind of like a bookmark in your timeline. So you can say, for example, this is the state of the code at version 1.0. We're going to tag it version 1.0. And so that will uh, be tagged on the commit. And maybe if for some reason you have to go back to that time, you can just check out the tag instead of ADB40D. Uh, 
Um, no one has to write that down in a, in a notebook or something. So some basic actions in Git are init, which creates a Git repository, status, which gets the current status of the working directory and staging area, where Git will say things like a file is unmodified or untracked or so on and so forth. Um, add and remove, which do what they say. Uh, they add new uh, files to the working directory or to staging or remove them. Uh, there's also reset, which reset removes, removes changes that were added to staging. Um, commit bundles the files uh, in staging and adds them to the repository. Um, diff shows the difference between two files or two versions of a file. And uh, log shows commits in the repository. So with that, let's actually put this into action, because that's a lot of uh, <laughs> words to be thrown at you. And I think it's easier just to see what happens. Uh, but if, it, if you found that hard to follow, hopefully the example will help clear things up. So let's go over here. So this is uh, the Git desktop, or the Git uh, bash client. And I'm going to go ahead and create a repo here in Git. So I'm going to say, we'll just make a directory called example. Uh, go to that directory. And so I'm going to do the first, the first uh, we'll go back to these so we can look. The first action, which is init, so git init. So it says initialized empty repository and then in the path. And you see the dot git um, at the end of that directory there. That's the folder where the whole git repository is stored. So that's where git keeps track of everything. Um, and it's also how git the tool knows that a directory is a or does have a repository. OK. So now we've just created an empty repository. If we type git status on branch master, no commits yet, nothing to commit. So we don't have any, we don't have any files that Git knows about. Um, and there's no commits in the repository. And we're on, a, we're on a thing called a branch called master. And we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create a file. And we're going to add some text to it. be very original here. All right, so we've got our text here. And if I use cat, we can see the text. So this is a text just printed out. And if I type git status now, you see untracked files, file.txt. So I've created a new file, and it's entered that untracked state. So we can go ahead and add that file to get, or to staging. And now if we type git status again, we've got file.txt here and changes to be committed, which is, where, uh, which is staging. Um, and you can see it, it even gives me a nice little, uh, a little hint. Git loves to give you little tips like this everywhere. Um, it says use git rm cache file to unstage. So that's just saying, Hey, if you want to take this back out of staging, here's how you do it. All right, so that's not what I want to do, though, because I want to commit this file to my repository and start tracking it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do git add uh, file.txt. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> git commit. Uh, and now it's going to ask me to add a message. So uh, this is where, when you make a commit, you basically include a small message that says, you know, what is what happened in this commit? What what is the record? So it's like it's like adding a note uh, to the timeline. So in this case, I'm going to say made file.txt. Not the most original, but it works. Great. And so do another status. Um, on branch master, nothing to commit, working tree clean. But now it, no, it doesn't say no commits yet. So if I type git log, you remember log shows the commits in the repository. We have one commit, commit d28, 486, 7, blah, blah, blah. Um, usually you only need like the first six of that to reference a commit, um, or six to eight. So, and it says author Noah Ratcliffe, 
uh, in a date that I made the commit and then what the message was. Great. So now I'm going to go ahead and make a change to the file. And we're going to say the quick brown dog jumped over the cool dog. Great. And we type git status. And so now we see it's modified. Um, and git gives us some more great tips. It says you can add the file to update what we committed. You can also check out to discard changes in the working directory. So that would say check out file.txt from the repository, replace uh, the changes I've made here in the working directory um, with what is in the repository. Of course, uh, we want to commit these changes. So we're going to go ahead and say git add file.txt. And we can do git status again. And great. Um, so we see it's, it's staged. Uh, and this time it says modified instead of before. It said new file. So git knows this is a file it's tracking. It's been modified. So we'll go ahead and say git commit. Uh, but this time I'm going to save myself some time. I'm going to use the tac m flag. So basically this is, uh, I'm going to just write a message inline, and then I'm going to say made the dog cool. Yeah, absolutely. So add um, adds the changes to staging. So if a file is, if, if Git knows that, it effectively adds the changes. Um, if Git knows that a file has changed, it'll say, hey, this file has changed. Um, but it won't do anything about it until you tell it to. And add is basically a signifier that, hey, I'd like to add whatever happens to this, according to you, to staging. So that so. would be creation or modification. Absolutely. It could be creation or uh, change, for sure. Um, basically, it's adding any differences in the working directory from head. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we made our commit. And now we type git status again. And of course, we'll expect to see that there are no changes because we haven't done anything since then. And we can type git log. And now we have two commits. And you can see head, which points at master right now, has moved up to our new commit. Uh, A92CEF4. Uh, and uh, another cool thing that we can do, we can do git log one line, which is a little bit easier to look at. And look at that. It gives us those um, seven characters. And it also just uh, strips out some of the unnecessary information, uh, makes it a little bit easier to read. So we'll be using that moving forward. Great. So we've successfully made a file, um, made changes, saw that git saw the changes, and committed those changes to the repository. So let's jump back for a little bit. Let's talk about branching. So uh, when we look in Git, it says that when we type git status, we see on branch master. So what does that mean? Branches are basically alternate timelines in a repository, or like a branching timeline. Um, they're super powerful, and they're, they're uh, one of the uh, most basic kind of ad, uh, advanced usages of Git. Uh, they can be used to work on new features, separate development code from production, um, and so on and so forth, or to separate individual developers from uh, each other's streams. And so you can kind of diverge and converge uh, as needed. Um, so relevant Git commands are git branch, checkout, and merge. Uh, branch will basically create a new branch for you. Um, or list the branches that are already in the repository, and you can also use it to delete branches. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, checkout uh, moves head to the uh, branch that you name. You can also use checkout to check out a specific commit or a tag. Uh, basically, checkout moves head. And merge uh, merges a branch uh, into another. So if you're currently on one branch and you say git merge develop, it will bring the changes from develop into your branch, and it'll try to merge all the changes together. Um, so as an example from the Git uh, book, we, let's say we have this uh, timeline. Again, I'm going to get up. Sorry, stream. Try to do my best. Complain to Sam if there's a problem. OK, so we have this timeline of commits starting at 98CA9, 
all through to 87 AB2. The reason they point backwards is because they're, they're basically, this is the beginning, and each one references back to the one before it in the timeline. Um, so, master was here, and it had uh, F30 AB. And so whatever the state of the working directory was at this time is stored in this commit. Uh, but then, somebody went and created a branch called testing, and it would have started at this uh, commit here. And then they added a new commit, uh, 87 AB2, on the branch testing, which is where your head is currently. And so 87 AB2 points back, because it is basically a copy of this timeline, it points back to where master is, um, but it's got changes that master doesn't know about yet. Master starts here, and then it goes and flows back, whereas head, which is that testing, flows back starting at a newer commit. So, if we change where head is, the flow is different. So now we're looking at the state of the working directory from F30AB back. So we can check out master and look at an earlier state in the, in the repository. Now, if we made a commit to master, it's easier if I just sit down at this point. If we made a commit to master, that um, was new, but we didn't have the changes from testing, now we've diverged. So master has a commit that points at F30AB, and testing has a commit that points at F30AB, but they're not necessarily the same changes. Um, so for example, somebody may have on testing, they may have set the player's speed to 900. And on master, uh, another developer went, went ahead and implemented the jump. And now there's two different kind of versions of the game. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're incompatible versions, but there are different versions. Cool. So let's go ahead and try creating a branch. So let's say get branch. So that'll list all the branches in our repository. And right now, we only have master. And you see it's marked in green, and it's got a little star, and that just means that's where we're at. So let's create git branch lion. So what we did was we've just created a branch called lion. So if we say git branch, now we see there are two branches, lion and master. And right now, they're both pointing at the same commit. So now I'm going to go ahead and git checkout lion. So now I'm on the branch lion. It's got the same history as master. So they are both looking at the same commit, but they're two different branches. So I'm going to go ahead and make a change here to our file. And I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, why are there two dogs? Wow. Well, one of them's going to become a lion, huh? So we're going to change quick brown lion jumped over the cool dog. So we're going to make that change. And if we do get status, we can see we've modified file.txt. Now, just an important note, if at this point we switched back to master, because git hasn't started tracking this change, this change would come with us. Because it's only, it only exists in our working directory. It doesn't exist in our repository. So if I changed back to master, it would still say that the file has been modified. Um, if there are incompatible changes, it will often also not let you change uh, back because it will say, hey, I can't handle uh, this file. It's newer, and there's a newer version from the branch, and it's just confusing. Um, so in this case, though, we're going to stay here. We're going to go ahead and say git diff. So this was, as I said before, this compares versions between two uh, files, two or more files, really. And in this case, git will list the differences between all files that are not staged for commit and where head is. So in this case, it's saying um, a slash file.txt. So that is uh, the current state versus b slash file.txt, which is the, or the current state in the repository, I should say, in the current state in our working uh, directory. It says there's a one line removal and one line addition. The line, the quick brown dog jumped over the cool dog was replaced with the quick, quick brown lion jumped over the cool dog. Um, Git doesn't track per word or character or anything like that. Um, in this case, it's line by line. So it's gonna say the quick brown dog jumped over the cool 
dog is totally gone and we've replaced it with something new. Now it'll be important to note um, because that's often how merge conflicts will come up is uh, people don't expect or people expect Git to do more mix in than it does. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to add this file git add and I'm going to use tack a here so this adds all the files in our repository or all the uh, untracked uh, changes all at once. And now if we do git status, I'm trying not to use my aliases here so we can see them in full, we see now it's green, so we've added it to, our, to staging. And we can commit made the dog a lion. And now git log one line. We see, just like in the picture before, we have the first commit, which is made file.txt. And then we have made the dog cool, which is where master is at. And we have made the dog a lion, which is where lion is at. Now, if we were to print out file.txt right now, it says the quick brown lion jumped over the cool dog. Um, but what if we did get checkout master? Ooh, there we go and git log one line. Now master doesn't even know about the rest of the history on the other branch, that's somewhere else. So it says the newest commit is made the dog cool and that's where I'm at. And of course, if we cat file.txt, says the quick brown dog jumped over the cool dog because that's, that's what master knows about. So let's go ahead and merge lion in. So we'll say git merge lion. So this says, please merge the changes from lion into this branch. And in this case, it's just a, uh, what is called a fast forward. So git says, oh, there's a new commit, and it points back to the one we're currently on. There's nothing in between. Great. We'll just tack that one on and move up. That's fine. And so now we can say git log one line. And now master and lion both know about AF26230 made dog a lion. Um, and that's where everybody's at. Of course, head is currently pointing at master. If I switch to lion, it would just be over there. Um, so now, if we do cat file.txt, of course, we'll see the quick brown lion jumped over the cool dog. Um, but what if branch is diverse? Because it's very rare that you uh, get the great condition of another branch goes somewhere else, they add something new, and then we pull it back into master, and then everything's great, and it, there were no changes in between. Um, often, you know, Git is used for multiple people collaborating um, across multiple branches over time. And so there's going to be files that get changed uh, kind of in between. Often it's different files, and that's when Git can usually just resolve things itself. Uh, even when it's separate lines within the same file, Git can usually do a pretty good job. But what if it's the same line? So let's go ahead and check out Lion again. So we're going to move head over to Lion. And we're going to go ahead and change the file. And we're going to go ahead and say quick brown lion dashed over the cool dog. And then we're going to go ahead, uh, add all, and commit. the lion dashes. Great. So git log one line. The lion dashes uh, is where lion's at. Go back to master and we'll make a change to the file as well and just now even if we added a new line there would be a commit um, or there would be a, mer a merge conflict but in this case I'm going to go ahead and change the exact same word because why not. Um, and leapt. We're going to say leapt. Uh, we're going to add that. And we're going to say used a thesaurus. Is that how you spell it? Who knows? That seems right. <laughs> so we've used a thesaurus here on master. And we've said the, the lion leaps over the dog. Great. Um, Again, 
git log one line. So we've said we have used a thesaurus here, and master, of course, is um, at the tip of its history. And of course, Lion is at the tip of its history, but there's two different histories. And so we are now in this circumstance and for the same file. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to check out master. And we're going to go ahead and merge lion. Git merge lion. Uh-oh. Conflict, all caps. Merge conflict and file.txt. Automatic merge failed. Fix conflicts and then commit the result. Now, uh, Git has gotten a little more serious in tone here. <laughs> There's a lot of caps. I'm getting a little worried here. So this is the point at which a lot of people go like, oh, it's all wrong. Git is terrible. We got we to gotta revert. We got to go back. Reset hard. Delete it all. Burn it down. It's all bad. So Git tries its best to uh, resolve divergent histories. And sometimes it can get a little confused and asks the human behind the keyboard for help. Um, changes to the same file or same regions of a file, diverging histories for a binary file, because Git can't read binary just like we can't. Um, it doesn't mean the end of the world, though. Conflicts uh, are marked inline by Git uh, in the files, and uh, particularly nasty conflicts can easily be resolved by using checkout tac tac hours slash theirs. So basically, if you're in a merge conflict state, you can individually say for a file, I would like to keep my version of this file and totally disregard their, their changes, or vice versa. Um, and that's a really easy way, especially in Unity, for example, um, to if there's a scene change that is a conflict. And you know, like, oh, it doesn't really matter that theirs is conflicting. Like, uh, my changes should overwrite it for some reason. Talk to your teammates, obviously. Um, you can also check out into a different file. So you can create a copy, or you could create their version of the scene, and then manually compare the changes in the editor in Unity by loading both and then looking at what's different. That's a tool I've used before. Um, and you can also use visual diff tools, like uh, Visual Studio Code provides a uh, diff tool. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to resolve conflicts. In our case, we have a pretty easy one. So we can say cat file.txt. And you see uh, this is the marker here. So basically what Git does is it, it marks with these kind of cool arrows, uh, easy to search in a text editor or whatever. Um, this is where this is what head has. So this is what master thinks the change should be. And this is what Lion has. And so we can see left and dash is the difference. Of course, if it was more complex, you might want to use a tool like code. So we use code. And um, code is just a shortcut for Visual Studio Code in Windows. Um, great. OK. So we've got it here. And Visual Studio Code is going to take uh, an hour to load my extensions and eventually give me diff tools. Great, OK. So it's highlighted here. Here's where we are, and here's what's the incoming change, right? Um, and so we could say accept current change, which is where we are, accept incoming change, which is where they are, accept both changes, or compare changes. So first, let's start by comparing the changes. And it just highlights, you know, um, they have leapt. We have, or we have leapt. They have dashed. OK. Um, so we, in, in this case, you know, we might talk to our, uh, whoever was working on Lion and say, you know, uh, I feel that it should be uh, leapt. And they say, no, 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 it should be dashed. And you, uh, your PM flips a coin, and then you figure it out from there. Um, in this case, we're going to go ahead and say that dashed is a better choice. So we're going to say accept incoming change, quick brown Lion dashed over the cool dog. Great. So we're going to save that, go back to git. I'm going to say get status. And it's going to say, you have unmerged path. Fix conflicts. Well, I've already fixed the conflicts. What do you mean, Git? Of course, Git doesn't know about the, the fix until you tell it about it. So we're going to have to say git add file.txt. Now we say get status. And it says, all conflicts have been fixed, but you are still merging. So we're in the merging state. We're kind of in an in-between state between two branches. So now we say git commit. When we say that, it gives us a nice uh, automated uh, commit message, merge branch lion. And it says there was a commit, or there were some conflicts, and um, we're now committing a merge. Great. So we've made that commit, git log one line. 
Sweet. So now we can see we left lion behind. We inserted um, our commit in between, and then we merged branch lion. And so this is the resolution commit where we picked uh, who is the leading uh, commit moving forward, whoever has control of the history moving forward. Uh, and so if we go back to lion, of course, it'll still say it has dashes. But if we check out lion, we can now merge master. And it'll just fast forward because we've already resolved everything. Great. Get log one line, and we're all on the same page. So that wasn't so bad. Now, some things you may have to be careful about. Uh, it is possible to track a file and commit a file with merge conflicts still in it, still marked, so it still has the arrows. This is I've seen this happen a lot of times on teams that work in Unity, and then they go, oh, there's a merge conflict, OK. And then they uh, don't really do anything about it, and then they just add it to the commit, and they resolve the, the conflict by adding all the files and then committing it. Um, and it's absolutely possible to do, and then it'll just be stuck in your history. Um, of course, you can uh, still fix it in the future, but just be, just be wary of that. Git will warn you, uh, but again, uh, a lot of people, when they see conflict in all caps, it's just blinders on, I got to fix this, Git is yelling at me. So take a breath, think about uh, what actually needs to be fixed. Use the tools at your disposal. Um, and usually things aren't nearly as bad as they might seem. Great, so I think we've covered the very, very basics of Git um, and handling a basic merge conflict. There are, let me just get this out of here, I'm sorry. Uh, there are uh, of course, I think we're good now. All sorts of cases, and um, this was a very, very simple demo, but this, this gives you the tools to kind of understand the back half of this uh, presentation now. So um, just as a note, Git is not something that you just have to use by yourself. Of course, it's a very useful tool just for solo projects, but um, the great thing about Git is that it's distributed. They love to say that. Um, repositories are individual to a, uh, or localized to the machine that they're on. So I have my repository here, uh, but on GitHub there might be another repository that is, um, that my repository is a copy of. Uh, and my repository can sync back and forth between that shared repository and other developers can have the same thing. Uh, but each repository is a fully self-contained copy of itself. And you can even have a web of repositories linking to each other, but that's very confusing and not that many people do that. Um, often, it's a bunch of repositories all kind of referencing back to the same shared repository. Um, the way that they sync between repositories is quite similar to how branches are merged. Uh, basically, uh, another a remote repository is stored in what is called a, a remote, uh, usually named origin when you clone some other re remote repositories, so you make a copy of it. Um, and so it will say, it will have a path for the branch on the remote repository like origin slash master or origin slash lion. And so to, to merge your lion with the remote branch lion, you would merge origin slash uh, lion after you fetch the changes. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, get, like I said, GitHub's the most popular. That's what most people know. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of tools that you can use. Clone will create a copy of a remote repository um, with everything configured and set up, so you provide an address uh, like github.com slash, uh, you know, NT Ratcliffe slash my cool Unity project. Um, and remote lets us configure the remote repository information in our local Git repository, so if for some reason we need to make changes, we can use remote to make those changes. Uh, push does what it says. It pushes our changes to the remote repository, so it takes our history on our branches locally, and pushes it up. And it's uh, usually only for the branch that you are currently on, though you can configure it to behave differently. Um, fetch retrieves changes from the local repository and stores them in our repository, but that doesn't merge it into our branch yet. It stores it under you know, the remote's name slash that branch. Um, changes can then be merged into our local branch when we say you know, merge origin slash stable or whatever. Uh, and pool is just a convenient tool that fetches and merges in one go. Um, and sometimes, looking at you GitHub desktop, fetch and pool are used uh, 
interchangeably. And in the case of GitHub Desktop, uh, I'm pretty sure it just says fetch or yeah, I can't remember, but I know it doesn't use pool, um, which can be confusing. Or maybe it just says sync, I don't remember anymore. Uh, yeah, so GitHub, <laughs> uh, GitHub is the most popular Git repository host. Um, it provides tools for collaboration and project management as well. So uh, things like forks, which are basically creating a uh, link to a clone of a repository on GitHub somewhere else that can point back to the original uh, repository. So say I make a derivative of a popular open source library and keep improving it for my own sake. Uh, I can do that and it also allows me to maintain the link that I can then uh, request to have my changes brought back into the original. Uh, and that's through pull requests, which either you know between branches or between projects, between repositories, you can say, hi, I have some uh, changes. Uh, I'd like to have them brought into this branch, and then Git will handle all that for you. Kent, did I see a hand? Yes, you did. What does FOSS stand for? Oh, we'll get there. Um, Kent asks, what does FOSS stand for? FOSS uh, is free and open source software. Um, and uh, GitHub is basically social media for FOSS people. There's definitely a lot of them out there. Kent, is, Kent was fist pumping. Um, and uh, GitHub d has done a really cool thing where it's basically created a community around free and open source software and uh, made it a lot easier for everybody to collaborate on tools. Uh, you can even see on my uh, GitHub profile, I have some, um, some repositories that, of software that I've committed or contributed to uh, in the open source community. And uh, GitHub also provides a great Git GUI client, and they also have lots of tools for learning Git. GitHub is a great place to get started using Git. Uh, and that's, again, why you often see it used interchangeably, because a lot of people, the first interaction they have with Git is via GitHub. All right, so we've got the basics. I know that was a lot of information, especially if this is your first time. Um, Git is super deep, and unfortunately, there's a lot of experiential learning that uh, one has to go through. Uh, there are resources at the end of this slide deck, and I will be posting that online. And so I recommend you check those out for more in-depth understanding. Um, so part two, if you've already been working with Git, uh, or now you've already seen some introductory to Git, so you should have kind of an understanding, here's some workflows and neat tricks to keep in mind. And again, remember, if this is uh, the first bit was a little too overwhelming and you've kind of checked out at this point, that's fine. All of this is gonna be posted in here for your reference moving forward. So once you get to the point that these might help you, um, you can reference it at any time. So let's talk about some basic workflow stuff. Uh, Git clients, like I said, they're built on top of the command line interface. This is an important thing to note. Everything uh, at its base level stripped down is running on the Git command line. Um, so the cool thing about clients is there's no need to remember the Git commands anymore. Yeah, see it says fetch. I knew it. Um, this is GitHub Desktop. Um, they provide uh, nice visual interfaces, uh, especially for branching, which can be a hard concept to uh, conceptualize in your head early on. Um, and they're great in most cases. Uh, GitHub Desktop is my personal favorite in terms of GUIs. I don't really use a GUI, but uh, if I could give a recommendation, that's the one to use. Uh, Source Tree is also really popular. I know a lot of people like it. Um, I think GitHub Desktop is prettier. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, I also have just found it a little less com confusing. Uh, there are some gotchas, though. They're not without their drawbacks. Um, they don't cover all cases. When Git gets itself in a little bit of a tangle, uh, sometimes they can even get confused because, again, they're built on top of the, the command line. Uh, and when something goes particularly wrong, uh, they can sometimes hide the problem rather than uh, make it evident. Um, they try to interpret what Git is giving them, and then that interpretation is fed to you, and so you're kind of getting third-party information. Um, of course, most uh, allow you to just drop into the command line, so if things get really messed up, you know, you can go there. Um, they can also make things confusing for new developers, which is why I think it's really, fun, or really important to understand what's happening at the command line level before you um, start using a client. Um, because they hide it. And sometimes they use different language. So you might find if you're reading a Stack Overflow post about how to resolve something, it's gonna use different language because most uh, forums will be talking in terms of the common language of the command line interface commands. Um, so that can be confusing. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't use a client. These are just gotchas to be aware of. Uh, also really important is the gitignore file. Uh, it's a special file you can put in your repository um, 
and, or in any directory in your repository that basically uh, sometimes you don't want certain files included in the repository like cache files, um, builds or binary files that change often or are just really big and annoying to have to send between developers um, or environment specific files like VS Code settings. Um, I don't want Aiden's Visual Studio configuration in my, uh, like <laughs> getting mixed up with mine. And I don't want a merge conflict every time I go to pool because Aiden likes having like uh, his line numbers a different way. Like that's just ridiculous. Um, so the git ignore file uh, provides uh, a way to, to fix this. It basically does what it says on the tin. It tells git to ignore certain files. Asterisk if they're not already being tracked. Um, Git can start tracking a file, and if you add it to gitignore, that won't stop it from tracking. It'll stop it from tracking any changes in the future. The file stays in the repository. Um, so you'd have, you have to remove it first. Uh, so Git ignores changes at paths that match patterns in gitignore. So um, for example, if we just say uh, these are all, uh, I think these is uh, ant type uh, patterns, but that's beside the point. Um, Basically, so if we say star.suo, any file name that ends with suo from the directory that gitignore is at down um, will uh, be ignored. And same works for paths. So we can say, for example, let's ignore everything in the debug or in the release or in the build folder, so on and so forth. Um, and the, the brackets with the capital and lower, that's basically just to say uh, you can use either. Uh, it's a matching pattern. I see, is there, oh, Ro. Maybe you made that mistake of putting something into Git, into the server, and then you had realized you wanted to ignore. How would you remove it from that? Yeah, so the question was, um, if you've added something that you realized you wanted to ignore, and it's already been uh, committed into the repository and pushed up to the remote and everything, uh, you can use a remove. So you can say, um, git remove uh, the file, and then it will remove it from the repository, and then you add you commit that remove, and then um, along with the, the git ignore change, and that should ignore it moving forward. Right, you're just removing it from the repository. It will still keep it locally. Great. Um, GitHub provides some really helpful git ignore templates. Uh, I personally use the Unity one. Um, they're kind of a pain in the butt to write from scratch, and I don't recommend you do it. So I recommend you grab, unless you're working with, you know, so depending on your tool set, it makes sense. But uh, in the case of Unity, it's absolutely helpful just to have a big old all cases uh, template. By the way, moving forward, and even before, but can't change the past, um, if you have any questions or even comments or I'm saying something wrong, like please shout it out. We're all learning together. This is a workshop. Um, and I'm running on a lot of assumptions that have built up over years of self-teaching. So um, I learned a lot of new things just putting together the slide deck. So the git config is um, where git stores its local settings, uh, like your uh, name and your email. We saw when I made my commits, it said committed by Noah Ratcliffe and with my email. Um, that's also how GitHub knows who made a commit. So when it says, you know, um, Noah Ratcliffe made this commit and it links it to my account. It's via my, uh, how my commit was signed by my local client from my git config. Um, so naming email is one that git usually just has you set up right away. It lets you know when it doesn't have that information. Um, aliases, uh, which we'll get to in a second, are also stored here. Um, preferences for certain behaviors. Uh, git sometimes, especially as it has evolved over the year, changes its behavior and it provides basically options in the config for you to say, oh, I'd like pool to work this way, or I'd like commit to work this way by default. Um, and system-wide, you have the .git config file, which uh, just goes in the root of your system. And uh, that is affects git across all of your repositories. And uh, re there is also a configuration file local to the repository stored in git, .git slash config. Um, this is where git keeps track of uh, remote repositories, like you can see down in the corner. Uh, for this, it has the remote uh, URL and then um, some uh, information about how it fetches, so on and so forth, uh, and also information about um, each of the branches and where to track on remote. Um, yeah, and it also that'll also store submodule information. Uh, Git aliases are shortcuts for Git commands. So I was actually, when I was doing the examples, struggling not to use these because I've been using them for so long. Uh, 
and they just save your fingers. You know, if especially if you're using the the GUI or the the uh, command line, they help a lot. And over time, I've added more and more as I found more and more needs. Um, so. Uh, I have a bunch of them, and my Git config is actually public on GitHub, so I don't have to go too deep into these. You can just go grab that and peruse it if you want. Um, but some really simple ones, like using A for add, you just, it's two keystrokes saved. Um, double A for add all. Um, checkout for, or CO for checkout, S for status, C for commit, so on and so forth. Um, it really helps, especially when you start dealing with uh, submodules, because they sometimes have a little bit of different commands that you might want to use, um, or different flags, and so on and so forth. Um, and you can get pretty advanced with them. Uh, I have a few ones that I'm particularly proud of, like clone from GitHub, CLGH. Uh, so I can, to clone a repository from GitHub, I say git CLGH, and then I just type the username slash the repository, so I don't have to type out the whole path and everything. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to clone one of my repositories, I would say git CLGH, NT Ratcliffe slash, uh, you know, Mac salad. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm making a little bash uh, function and then invoking it uh, to pass a parameter in. I also have uh, remote add origin, which basically if you commit, if you create a Git um, repo locally before you create it on GitHub, you have to wire it up manually because you haven't cloned. Um, and uh, Raug, uh does that for you. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. There's also uh, add a submodule, same as CLGH, but with submodules. Uh, publish um, pushes your current branch to uh, basically tells GitHub or the remote repository um, about your current branch that you're on. And uh, MV tag uh, does a little fanciness to move a tag to a different commit because uh, it's not particularly straightforward to do that. Um, yeah, so submodules, I've talked about them a little bit. Uh, they are controversial, so I'm not going to go super into depth about them. Um, the, basically, they are a Git repository stored inside of another one, uh, and it's a link to another Git repository. Uh, so it allows you to do things like uh, link a central library to multiple projects. Uh, and also, uh, you can keep head locally in your repository at different places than other repositories, so I can be on a different version of the uh, remote or the library than another one of my projects. One project can be different from another. Um, and that's where tagging really comes into, uh, comes into play. It, we use submodules for our internal libraries. So here you can see here's a, a game that uh, we're working on right now. And we have uh, in the plugins folder for Unity, we have Mac Salad and Meat Sauce, both of our internal libraries linked. And you can see on GitHub it says the respective commits. Um, I enjoy submodules uh, mostly. They can be a pain in the butt to work with, and they sometimes when they break, it's not straightforward why or how. Um, it doesn't anymore, but for a long time, the official Git documentation for submodules uh, uh, like literally recommended that you don't use them. Uh, <laughs> the like the first line in the in ha like the submodules uh, reference page was something to the effect of if there's literally any other way to do it use that, um, and they recommended, you know, package managers and so forth. But Unity doesn't have a great package manager solution that I'm aware of yet. Um, so that's what we use. Um, yeah, they can just create weird headaches sometimes. And uh, the pro Git book available on the uh, Git website uh, has great information about how to use submodules and awesome information about everything with Git. It says pro Git, but really it's just how to use Git very well explained. Um, I, pretty much all of this slide, it, or all of this uh, presentation, is uh, a condensed form of that, uh, that book. So now let's talk about organizing your Git repositories. So branches can be incredibly powerful, but they can also be very unwieldy if, you aren't, if you don't have any intention with them. Um, a branching model is a defined structure for organizing branches in one or many repositories. So it's a way of saying, OK, this is just like you would have code standards. This is how we organize our GitHub or our Git repositories. Um, one size does not fit all um, between project to project. It really depends on what your goals are with the project. So for uh, us as a team, Ayla has, uh, we do a lot of prototyping. We're constantly iterating, um, and we're moving very fast. And we also uh, 
kind of have the same dev cycle for every single project, but that's just for our Unity projects. If we have a web project, it might be different. Um, they're also, uh, branching models are also really helpful for automation. As somebody who builds our tools and also maintains our branching models, I really like it that way because I know um, when I put together a automation system, I know that all projects will follow the same structure. And we'll talk about automation in a little bit. But you'll see why it's helpful in a second to have a consistent way that um, your repositories are structured. Um, there's an article by, uh, ooh, he's on the next slide, uh, Vincent Dreisen. Uh, called a successful Git branching model that uh, this graphic is from. And I really like his approach and Ayla's, all of Ayla's branching models are loosely based off of his approach. Um, and I recommend you give it a read because it goes way more into detail uh, about kind of what we're doing or at least provides a reference point. Um, so yeah, here's our branching model. Uh, it's loosely, like I said, loosely based off of uh, Dreisen's model. Um, the flow is, uh, personal or feature branches, so feature branches being I'm working on the jump mechanic, personal branches being my branches and Ratcliffe, Aiden's branches, uh, uh, Aiden Markham, right, or A Markham. Um, changes are constantly flowing between personal uh, branches and the development branch called dev, and so there's constantly changes flowing back and forth, and dev is kind of where uh, if I put changes in from my work when I'm done with a specific thing, um, Aiden pulls those changes out later when he merges in his changes and so on and so forth. Um, and we try to keep our personal branches in sync with dev as much as possible. But the nice thing about having personal branches is if, for example, Aiden's having a specific problem, he says, hey Noah, can you just check out my branch and work on that? I don't have to have access to his local repository. It's still pushed up to the remote. Um, so, uh, Next we have dev goes to stable. We try not to have things flow back from stable into dev. If you're making a change, you wanna make it on dev and then push it into stable. There's exactly one case where we allow that. Um, and then changes from flow from stable into release. So dev is where unstable kind of work in progress features are. Uh, stable is where features that we believe are complete are uh, put and then that's where things go into uh, our, our little bit of our broader QA flow. And then release is a uh, archive of currently released code. So when we make a release on the App Store, for, for example, that's what is exactly, that is one-to-one -one with what is on the App Store. So um, on our dev branch, we have hourly development branches, uh, our development builds, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, on stable, uh, the commits trigger release mode builds instantly, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then the latest stable build is used when we release a version, so we take, we pluck the latest build from stable and push that out on the app store um, and then move the code from stable to release and um, this is this also allows us to make a patch on release if we have a bunch of different changes in dev and um, the game is already you know because we move so fast a game has already progressed by many many features by the time we identify a bug in release we say okay well we can make a change in release on a patch branch and then merge that back into release. And this is the one case where changes will then flow backwards from release all the way back to dev and then eventually into our personal branches. Um, so uh, that's the basic model we use for all of our prototypes. Uh, we also make good use of template repositories. Um, GitHub has a feature for this, but I don't know anything about it, sorry. Uh, you should look into that if uh, you wanna know more. I'm not gonna talk anything about it. Um, template repositories and the way we use them can be used to enforce branching models because you can set things up with the branches that you want and uh, just leave it up that way. And uh, you can, if you're using submodules, they'll already be linked and you can keep them up to date. Um, and they're easy to update. So if I change one thing in the template repository, then I know moving forward all of our prototypes are gonna start from that uh, template code base. Um, so for example, we have a Unity template project that all of our, pro our prototypes start from, and whenever we identify something, we're like, oh, it'd be cool if moving forward, that's the answer to that is putting it in the template um, or updating one of our libraries and then updating that in the template. So how to make a template repository? One, clone the repository, uh, uh, clone the template, or rather, how to use a template repository. Clone the template repository. So you already have a repository up and it has whatever you want. Um, you clone that, then you change the remote um, origin that, or the remote address that origin points to, 
So uh, we mentioned that you can use remote to change where uh, your repository points to. And so what you can do, you can rem uh, in this case, I have a bash script here, but that removes origin and then uh, adds a new one with the remote. And then you squash all of the history from before you pulled down the template into one commit. Uh, this is primarily to prevent big bloated um, repositories and also GitHub will <laughs> keep adding to your daily, they have a little thing that tracks your commits over time. And if you keep cloning a template repository and then putting it up, that history is, keeps getting added to, to GitHub and then eventually you get one very, very uh, important day in your timeline because it was the original time that you created the repository because it keeps doubling the commits that are up there. Um, for a long time I had just like one block that was like the darkest color, highlight color that you could get on GitHub. <laughs> So squash the template history, um, then publish to the new remote, um, and then never do that again because you can make a script to do it and add it to the template re repository. So in our case, we have a script. It's right here. It's pretty simple. It's 30 lines, and it's mostly spaces. Um, changes to the right directory. It uh, replaces the remote repository, um, and it prompts the user for, for the URL. And then it does that for you. It squashes the history for you. Uh, it also, in this case, we don't actually uh, set up the branches on the template repository. Uh, you can, but we don't. Uh, so it makes up, it makes those for you, and it also uh, pushes them up to remote, and then it deletes itself. And then um, I had some trouble getting it to commit its own uh, uh, removal. So <laughs> you, it does remind you to do that at the end of the day. But uh, that's the little script. That does it for you. So here's our template on GitHub. Uh, it's a mostly empty Unity project. It's got some settings that uh, are nice to have by default, especially since we work in uh, mobile on iOS. Uh, it has our internal libraries, max salad and meat sauce, added as sub modules. Max salad points to the latest release tag. Meat sauce points to the master branch uh, because we don't have a particularly rigid release cycle there. Um, that's just kind of a conglomeration of all the our assets and stuff that we, we've uh, put together for different prototypes. Um, it already has all the pro plugins and libraries we use, like uh, different packages from the asset store and other you know, open source stuff that we've used. Um, and it's pre-configured for our build automation system um, right out the gate, and it has some configuration files and stuff. And um, every prototype starts here. So that's kind of what we use every time that we start a project. We don't have to create a new Unity project and set up the config. Like, so we got to set up fast lane and we got to change these settings because they have to be this specific way and oops I forgot X like it's all there in the template um, we use a similar branching model for our internal tool max salad um, it's built to match a roadmap on Trello so here's an example of how you can kind of match a branching model to a production cycle in a different way um, we have project and feature branches just as our normal model that goes uh, back and forth between dev uh, but then we use Next and Master. Next is the kind of like beta branch and um, holds stable features. And Master holds the latest release. And again, if there's any patches, we can bring them back. Um, but they match these lists in Trello. So um, Maxile is a living uh, library and evolves with each prototype. And during development, we might need to make changes. Um, so we can create a specific branch for that uh, project and push that up to the remote because submodules have to have some kind of remote uh, branch to track. And if we make changes and then try to push that up, when Aiden, if say I made a change and then try to push that up, when Aiden pulls it down, Git will say something scary, like I can't figure out what's happening with the submodule. Um, it, the, the repository says there's commits that don't exist because my local repository has a history that the remote does not, um, that the remote max salad does not. So uh, we create a branch for that specific project and, uh, but by default, they point to a release tag. Um, if uh, bespoke changes are made, the project branch is created and pushed. Um, and then when we're done uh, with a project or at a certain point, you know, we say, okay, let's get this folded into Max Salad. We can merge the project branch into dev and then eventually it, it finds its way into a release uh, with Max Salad. But often those things are made very much in the moment and so uh, we want to clean it up before we bring it into Max Salad. So we might add comments or clean up, make it uh, adhere a little bit better to Max Salad's whole model. Uh, Kent? Why do we call it Max Salad? Why do we call it Max Salad? Because it was the base for Crazy Plates 
and Max Salad is, of course, uh, the perfect base for a garbage plate. Meat sauce is the beautiful, beautiful topping, and that's why all of our art assets are stored there. Um, unfortunately, they have the same abbreviation. <laughs> the next branch stores stable features, like I said. It's kind of a beta branch, um, and it, it matches with the cards that are in the next list on Trello, um, and it triggers hourly documentation builds. Um, master branch is always the latest release. Um, we merge commits from next to master and tag them with the version number and also create a release on GitHub, which is just kind of a special a little representation of tags with some extra uh, sugar. Um, when we create a release, we rename the next list in Trello to version x.y.c. You can kind of see it here um, on the right. So uh, now it's a change log. Congratulations. Um, releases on GitHub uh, also get the change log just basically typed from the cards in Trello. And uh, patch branches are created from master for critical bug fixes. So you can see in this terrible <laughs> screenshot, I should have not used this one. Uh, there was a really bad day five days ago where I released a version and then immediately identified an issue um, while working on some other stuff. And so like minutes after the first version had to release a bug fix. Um, but I was able to do so because I, I had this branching model. And the master branch triggers instant documentation builds. Um, so patch branches are um, created for master for critical bug fixes. We pretty much already talked about all this with the prototypes. Um, some people will name a patch or feature branch after the issue number on GitHub. That's a pretty common uh, way to go. So when you create a issue on GitHub, which is basically to say, hey, there might be a problem, or I'd like a feature, or so on and so forth, uh, when handling that, people will often just call their branch like, uh, it's given like an identifier like four. It's just the fourth issue created. Um, people will often just say, you know, branch like, um, they might say something about the feature, so they might say uh, like flowers tack four, or just four, um, and then, uh, they can create that branch and then merge it back in and, or with a pull request um, to resolve the issue. All right, so let's talk about automation because I've been hinting at it a whole lot. And I think this is the last section of the slide deck for anyone getting wary. I know this is a lot of information. So continuous integration, if you're not familiar, is the practice of integrating changes from different developers in the team into a, into a main line as early as possible in best cases several times a day. Um, that's according to Codeship in the article, What is Continuous Integration? Um, CI is often used in reference to automated testing systems specifically. Um, automated tests are effectively software that um, test runs code under pre-programmed circumstances and compares the results to expected outcomes. Now, for people in the room that understand uh, testing, uh, that's a grave oversimplification, but it's kind of hard to reduce exactly. Um, a test for the add function, for example, might um, make sure that calling add with two and three results in five. Um, so you'd say, you know, you'd have a, a separate bit of code that's written to call the add function providing two and three, and, and it asserts that the result is five. And if it is not, then the build will be marked as a failure. And you'll say, hey, this is wrong. <laughs> your, your add function thinks two and three are six. Um, so this is usually, uh, they, it's usually marked, marked as passing or failing tests. You might have seen in open source software on GitHub, uh, at the top there's a little badge that might say like build passing, and uh, that's uh, a representation of their underlying automation system. Uh, it's great because it helps uh, issues in code be reported early, especially on very large scale teams like uh, and big software like Windows, for example. <laughs> um, Windows has one would assume thousands of tests. I don't have any specific metric, but um, there are entire teams dedicated to developing and improving tests for Windows. Uh, so they're writing software to test software. Uh, yeah, so uh, CI uh, automated systems uh, can watch a remote repository and run tests when new code is pushed. Uh, so the, these systems are like Jenkins, Circle CI, GitHub also provides a thing, I think. Um, Tests can be triggered from branches, tags, commit messages, et cetera. Pretty much the sky's the limit. Anything that is information in Git, you can use. Um, GitHub has tools for running tests on pull requests even. So a pull request can be made and GitHub will automatically check to make sure that, that it, can, it can even be merged. 
uh, before any human has to look at it. So a pull request can be re instantly rejected, like, ah, no, you didn't pass the such and such test. And that could be as simple as, does it adhere to the coding standards? Um, pull requests can also automatically be merged if all tests pass. So again, no humans have to look. I say, hey, computer, I think this code's good, and you tell me. Um, and then it'll do it for you. Uh, tools like Jenkins and Circle CI can also be used to build software automatically. Uh, builds can be triggered from a branch, tag, commit message, et cetera, just, just like tests. Um, different build configurations uh, can be set up for different branches as well. So you might have a different build configuration for the development branch than you would have for the release branch. Um, Builds also can be de deployed to development or production environments uh, automatically from these uh, software. So for example, if I had a repository for my website and I have the development branch which deploys to a development environment where I can go you know, on an internal server and see the development version of the web app. Um, but if I push to release, it'll actually deploy to my website li live on the internet. Uh, that can all op happen automatically. I don't have to manually go into FTP and upload the files or whatever. Um, automation is, uh, build automation is often used in tandem with uh, CI tests. Uh, if the build t passes the tests, then it's reasonable to assume that one, or it's reasonable for one to assume that you could deploy it. Uh, so again, very little human involvement with the process. It can just kind of happen automatically, which is great. Um, our build pipeline, um, we use Jenkins and a tool called Fastlane for iOS and Android builds. Um, we don't use tests. Um, build, the build status is reported also in Discord, so we actually get a message when a build completes, uh, what its status was, what the changes were. Um, that's cool because you know it's deployed straight to our devices, and so we can um, say, oh, it's done, and then we pull up the iPad and start working. We don't have to go online and check the status. Um, for development branches, uh, Jenkins checks uh, the, all the repositories hourly, and if there are new changes, a build is started, um, and if the build succeeds, the app is deployed to our test devices. Uh, so we have iPads that every hour, and it's not on the hour all of the uh, builds run the way Jenkins handles it. It's actually kind of chunked up based on the, the uh, project. So across an hour, all the projects are being checked, though. For stable, um, Jenkins build starts, Jenkins starts a build immediately after a commit is made to stable on the remote repository on GitHub. Um, so in this case, uh, with our branching model, that would be a merge from development. Um, if the build succeeds, the app is uh, deployed straight to the app store for internal testing. So it doesn't go out live, but it goes, the way the app store works is you, can, is you put a build up and then from within app store's tools, you can promote it to the app store. Uh, but it goes up so that we can uh, manually move to testing on test flights. So we go onto the App Store uh, developer portal and push a build to test flight, and then we can check test it internally or in our beta group with our patrons. And then eventually, if it passes all those tests when we release, we can move it to release um, and then archive the code. Max Salad's documentation is built with a tool called DocFX, and that again is pretty much the same with dev and stable, except it's dev and next. And uh, the documentation is built pretty much just like regular old software. What's up, Kent? So the question was, if we wanted to integrate tests, uh, do we know how we would? I am aware of some features in Unity for testing Unity projects. Um, and I've seen them in use, but I haven't done anything with it myself. Jenkins, uh, basically at its core, Jenkins is just software that invokes other software based on certain conditions. So the sky's really the limit with Jenkins. So if Unity provides a way to test its software, then um, Jenkins can call it. Um, and the, so it, most testing suites often are just, just that. There's some kind of tool that you invoke, just like Git or Unity or whatever, um, or Fastlane. And so uh, it would be, it may be as simple as uh, writing the correct bash script. To, to run the test and verify the result. Um, Jenkins also has a ton, a ton of uh, plugins and uh, just a great developer community. So there, if, if you want to do something, there's probably something out there for it. Like the Discord uh, 
bot was like two clicks for me because there's already a plugin out there for it. So yeah, that's the big information dump. Um, hopefully there was something in there that was a nugget for everybody in the room. Uh, maybe got you thinking about how you might uh, integrate uh, some of these practices or maybe just think outside the box in terms of your own Git practices or if this was all new to you, um, got you started on the path. Um, there's my contact information if you want to ask further questions or just keep in touch. Um, and like I said, there's resources at the end of the slide deck. So everything that I brought up in the slide deck or in the slides uh, are all linked here. So you can check all that stuff out and uh, I'll be posting these after uh, the talk. So yeah, if there's any other questions, I'd love to have more of a discussion, talk about certain things. We can turn the lights back on. Thank you. And uh, I think Sam has been watching the chat in case there's been. Oh, there's a question over here. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, sure. So um, the question was basically, if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, what's the difference between a merge and a rebase, right? Um, so I was kind of afraid a rebase would come up. Uh, I, to be honest, haven't used rebasing a lot because I try to avoid having to use it uh, because it can create some pretty nasty scenarios when you're working with others in a distributed sense. Uh, but as far as I understand it, rebase moves head in a kind of like less than kosher way. Uh, it, it is a destructive kind of action on your uh, commit history. So uh, say I were to rebase my repository and basically manually push the history back to a certain point and say this is now moving forward, we're going to start from here and then start up. So imagine like a branch on a tree. Um, you have like one branch going out over here, or you have one branch going in a straight line, and then one day you just say, no, we're actually going to start growing back from over here. But the problem is from the remote um, side of things, it's hard to, it is not easy to communicate that to uh, other local repositories. So if you push it up to remote, it's, uh, the remote says, whoa, 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 dude, like, your timeline's totally different than mine. Something's wrong here. Um, so it can be, it's something that I just generally try to avoid and I never really took the time to learn and understand much better than that. Um, as far as I understand, there's li limited circumstance, at least like in my entire time using Git, I haven't really ever had to use a rebase, but um, the, there's limited circumstances where uh, you couldn't just do something else like, um, there is, I think it's relatively new, but there's a feature in Git that you can use to roll back to a commit, which is often what somebody wants to do with a rebase, which is like, okay, burn it all down, I just wanna go back to here, right? Just put, put me back at this commit. Um, and you could, basically what Git will do is it'll create a new commit that applies all of the changes between where you are now and where you want to be. It basically creates a new commit that undoes things, so instead of forcefully moving the history back with a rebase, it adds to the history a commit that undoes. So, um, but basically, I, as far as I understand it, rebase is kind of a destructive way to change history. Any other thoughts, comments, concerns? I said it all wrong. <laughs> I guess that's I guess that's one good step in the in the right direction. If you want to talk more about Jenkins uh, at some point, uh, love to chat. 
I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, wrestling with our configuration. And one day I'm going to write a uh, post about how our whole build pipeline works and how to set it up with Unity because it was a very big pain in the butt. Um, but it was mostly a pain in the butt on the iOS side of things. Uh, I, Unity and iOS don't play too well together in an automated environment. Great. Well, if there's uh, no further questions, I think I'll wrap it up. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you to everybody on the stream. I'm going to go ahead.